Here we are with another outing of Atlantis. Now, this episode comes right after the last review, Miller's Crossing, and that is going to be significant as we go on. To start things off, the Stargate is broken, which is a bad situation continuing the show is called Stargate. McKay is accused of having broken it by trying some kind of improvement program. Now, I say accused because despite the timing of the malfunction, apparently McKay's fiddling has already been ruled out as a cause, along with a few other things. You know how it is. Classic case of, we can't fix it because according to everything we see, it's not broken. They're interrupted by something breaching the city, a kind of probe with weapons damage on it that makes little sense if it's just some deorbiting satellite or something. This is a mystery, although we already have one, so it might have to get in line. In fact, Major Lauren thinks that Zelenka should deal with the probe and McKay stick with the gates since that's more important, but Shepard is adamant. If somebody has found them, that's a threat. That takes priority over a not working gate. And it's a good thing that McKay is on it too, because Zelenka thinks the probe is a lost cause. But McKay's got all kinds of clever ideas on how to crack this nut. After a little tinkering, it is briefly revealed that there's nanite code. Oh, balls, not them again. We can't afford to go flying the city off every bloody time they find us. Have you seen the price of gas lately? After the titles, McKay tells this to Shepard, but almost immediately after that, the probe blows up, destroying all of the evidence. McKay finds this whole situation suspicious, something Ronan agrees with during his sparring practice with Shepard, and he says that Taylor feels the same. Not about Rodney's lab, I'm sure that put a smile on Ronan's face, but rather the idea that the people around here seem to be a little off lately. It's like you, you just can't trust anybody. <coughs> Not that anything specific comes to mind, though. Shepard goes to see Keller for treatment, except she says he's fine. There's no cut, even though there's a little blood there. That's mighty suspicious, especially after that nanite code in the probe thing. So he asks for a scan to make sure. And that says that nothing is off, so he insists on a blood test afterward. Make sure he doesn't have anything else funky in there. They run into a lot of crazy stuff not including getting drunk and going on shore leave. Well, it turns out that the Major and Keller are up to something because they hold a shadowy discussion about Shepard and McKay's behavior that shows that they're keeping something from them. There's also notable absences that we as the viewers should er, note. Carter, despite being in charge, is nowhere to be seen and not even mentioned. The Wraith, who has been helping with the replicator code, same thing. So we can see there's something else that's off here, too. And when Keller doesn't seem to think anything is strange about a magically healing cut, Shepard decides it's time to do the only logical thing. <laughs> what is the matter with you? Admittedly, logic can sometimes be in the eye of the beholder. This is a test. One of the other three have already taken it to see if they can heal virtually instantly, which they do. So unless they're all Wolverine, something is wrong. McKay tries to check the results of the blood test that Shepard had taken, except it's not there, nor is the scan. So yeah, conspiracy, probably an evil one. I'd like to give him the benefit of the doubt, but it's not going to be easy. Usually conspiracies are evil. Especially when McKay tries to figure out when the infirmary is clear and discovers that the only life signs in the entire city are the four of them. Oh no, wait. The four of them and one way out in the boondocks. Well, McKay and Ronan are going to go check that out. But meanwhile, the scan is complete on Shepard. This is what it looks like when they test James Bond for STDs. As for the fifth person, they're in a hidden room behind the wall. You know, like in the movies when they pull out on a book and the bookcase spins. I've always wanted one of those, mostly to hide from people I don't want to see. Behind the wall is none other than Dr. Weir, who was left behind in the replicator version of Atlantis, remember? As you might have gleaned, none of this is the real Atlantis. Although, there is an easy test. Not one I normally recommend, but it is easy to do. 
the replicators are running this place, but this right here is not the real Atlantis team. They are human, but they are effectively clones built from the bottom up by the nanites in their bodies. Their memories constructed from when their minds were probed during the original visit to the replicator city with updates based upon the memories of the real Dr. Weir. The knife test confirms that Dr. Weir is also one of these clones. And Not Keller explains to her that Oberoth had the real Dr. Weir killed. Whenever she linked with the rest of the replicators, her humanity was disruptive in his view. Although really, Oberoth has a real get-off-my-lawn vibe to him anyway, so I'm not surprised. During this, the other four are discussing their situation. McKay points out that there is nothing to go back to on Atlantis, that the lives they have there are just memories and are being lived by the real versions of them. Taylor points out this doesn't make them less human, which is true, although what Rodney says is also true. Still, it's easier to sort all this back out over there instead of here, so let's just go and work out the details when we get back. Or, if you want to call it back when you haven't actually been to the place that you're going to. Not Keller alludes to what this whole thing is about, and Weir pieces it together. This is all about ascension, the one thing that the replicators can't do, no matter how human-like they might try to be. By growing humans, they'd hoped to find the elusive quality to them, the soul that she says, which is what allows humans to move on to a higher plane of existence. And growing these four is necessary because of that whole wiping out human settlement strategy. Except, now the replicators here have been found out. Yeah, that probe was from the rest of the replicators, and they'll be coming here to destroy the city. So they'll get the duck out of Fodge. Except, these replicators aren't exactly the good guys either. They plan to wipe the memories from the five of them and start this thing all over again, keeping it up until they get their answers. So when Not Keller comes back to explain, she's told this just isn't going to work. Humans are too stubborn to just accept this situation, even with a memory wipe. Sooner or later, they'll figure it out again and again and try to escape. But the point of this is moot. The attack on the city has already begun, and they're boned. Turns out building humans from scratch takes a lot of energy. Not to mention all the late-night diaper changes. Ugh. So, with no power left for defenses, they look screwed. But Dr. Weir points out that if they do nothing, then this is nothing more than another failed experiment, like the way the ancients viewed the replicators. That's a kick in the old ASCII. The replicators here cannot leave without risk of being followed, so Not Keller gives the five of them a device to track the replicator ships in order to try to stop the genocide. Gets them to a jumper so that they can cloak and escape the destruction. They hop out of the system with the replicator ship back to the replicator homeworld, where they discover the shipyards have been rebuilt and are chug chug chugging along. That is not good news for those of us who are against mass human extermination. So, the group makes contact with an Atlantis patrol to let them know what's up. Dr. Weir is the one to talk to them. You know, make this less awkward since there's not another her around to go WTF when the doppelganger shows up. Especially since we had an episode called Doppelganger earlier this season. She explains what happened, but also as there's something that can be used against the replicators. And once that enticement is out there, then broaches the subject of the other four of them. Makes it a little easier to not just hang up right now. Nice jacket. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, new. Man, the Prime versions always get all the cool stuff. They share their new toy, but it's the Nanite Shepherd that cools the jets on the pair of McKays who want to jump straight to work on this, noting that as Nanite-constructed beings, they're a security risk and cannot go back to the city. This shows just how real the Nanite humans are, though that the first thought isn't about the four of them, but about the people back in Atlantis and on Earth that need to be protected. That's a sign that they feel the same things and have the same values. And despite being cut off from that, they're still willing to put those people before themselves. Which, of course, the team does every time they risk their lives. I know I'm so who the hell's this other guy? No, he's you as well. No, there's only one me. Apparently not. There's nothing but a copy then. 
From what I understand, even though he's not the original, he's as much Ronan Dex as you are. I don't like it. Although I think we saw this coming from Ronan. And the other Ronan isn't in love with that. Although he figures, hey, he's got the upgrade after all. He can go kick Wraith ass just fine on his own. Taylor does a good job of talking her Ronan down, pointing out that they can understand how the others likely feel because they're the same. I like this aspect of the episode a lot, that the two groups don't turn against each other, that while there can be varying degrees of discomfort, the two McKays are delighted at the situation, actually, this is about exploring the existential implications of having an entire life you never lived and can't have. Ronan, for instance, carries all the emotional baggage of the choices that another man has made without having any of the benefits of the life that he now leads. And Dr. Weir cuts to the heart of the issue. I guess what really bothers me is just knowing that you and the others will always consider me less than what I really am. Fortunately, the replicators are here to sort out this ethical dilemma for us. The gate is cut off, but Dr. Weir has a plan grabbing a jumper and hauling ass. The replicators pursue and shoot them down, but not to worry, it really is part of the plan. The Nanite crew are the ones who are on board, creating a distraction so that the Atlantis personnel can make it back home. But it's not without its emotional impact regardless. McKay throws himself into his work to distract himself about Dr. Weir being confirmed dead. Incidentally, Note that I said that the two Dr. Weirs are delighted at their situation. Well, that's because their immediate thought was to jump into work on sorting out that replicator device together. But as Zelenka notes to Rodney, that's Rodney's way of coping with things. He throws himself into his work so he doesn't have to face his feelings. So we're seeing that before, it was easy for him to handle because he immediately got to focus on his work rather than on the problem of there being two of him and what their life will be. Work will make me forget everything. And now we find out at the end, he's doing the same thing again. Although one good thing does come from it, his devotion on keeping his mind off of Dr. Weir's death allows him to eventually crack the system and be able to track every one of the replicator ships, which is good. What's not good... Oh, crap. On Thursday, the arc continues with Be All My Sins Remembered. 